Welcome to the second in our series of XACC Tech Talks. My name is Cahill McCabe from the Xilinx University Programme. And before going to our speakers, as I did the last time, I'm going to start by briefly introducing the XACC Programme and this series of talks. The Xilinx Adaptive Compute Cluster Programme is a special initiative to support novel research in adaptive compute acceleration for high-end computing. The program covers research into systems, architecture, tools, and applications. The program itself is managed by the Xilinx University program, and over the last year, we've set up four XACC host centers at ETH Zurich, National University of Singapore, University of Illinois, and UCLA. The centers consist of compute nodes currently enabled with Xilinx Alveo compute acceleration hardware, which are remotely accessible by researchers around the world. This series of tech talks is intended to highlight some of the research that is currently being carried out within the XACC program. We are inviting interested researchers to apply to join the program. And for more information, you can see xilinx.github.io slash XACC. After they have happened, you will also be able to find archived recordings of these talks on the website. And the first talk from two weeks ago is already available, and this one will be uploaded in the next few days if you want to watch again or share with your colleagues. To our second XACC Tech Talk in the series, we have three speakers today. The first two will share a talk on VNX and EasyNet. Dr. Mario Ruiz, my colleague in the XUP team, will introduce VNX, which enables 100G UDP in Vitus Alveo designs. And Shen Hao He, a doctoral student in the systems group at ETH Zurich, will talk about EasyNet, an open source 100G TCP IP framework that can also be used with Alveo and Vitus. Welcome everyone to this presentation. And uh, this session is all about scaling out your applications. So as Cajal mentioned, I will be talking about Vitus Network Example or VNX, and I'm part of the Silence University program. Let me give you some background. So, a year ago, we introduced the Silex Adaptive Compute Cluster, as Cajal mentioned. And in this slide, I'm showing the ETH Zurich hardware organization. So there are five nodes in here. One is dedicated for development, and four of them are dedicated for deployment of your accelerators. Among those two de development uh, deployment nodes, there are 10 Alveo cards um, between U250 and U280. Each of these Alveo cards has two networking interfaces. One of networking interfaces is connected to the network switch, and the other one is connected to its neighbor. So this configuration gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of the, the scenarios that uh, researchers can actually run on the cluster itself. So however, the challenge is that at the time we actually opened the XCCC to researchers, there was no stack while by, with by this integration that uh, was available to researchers. Therefore, that lack of networking capabilities on the Vitis uh, framework reduced the capabilities of the cluster itself. So for that reason, uh, the, we are actually introducing uh, the VNX. So the RBO cards provide a great opportunity for compute acceleration. However, in the traditional model, all data movement happens with the host machine. And this might not be efficient or the best solution for many applications. And for this reason, providing networking on Vitus platform is paramount to support the XCCC and research initiatives, as well as HPC applications that actually want to scale out outside of one uh, review card. So adding networking to acceleration card is not a new idea, but it requires a deep knowledge of the whole stack, as well as a lot of hardware expertise. The idea of VNX is to provide an easy integration with Vitis, and so in a way that you can actually connect your compute kernels very easily with uh, the networking stack of the VNX. And the other part of this is that provide an easy to use interface for users on the software side. And this is done thanks by PIC. So let me move on to the VNX architecture itself. If we look at the uh, Vitis uh, Alveo platforms, those platforms are split in two parts. One is the static regions, which provides the base infrastructure for your oscillators to run. This is PCI, uh, memory controllers, uh, and, and another part of configuration that is running all the time on your, uh, 
on the LBO cards. And the, this yellow box is the dynamic region of the user logic that actually is where the users actually deploy their accelerators. The, the nice thing about the LBO platforms is that the QSFP or the GD transceivers, GI transceivers for the QSFP are bypassed directly from the static region to the user region. And this actually allows us to connect the networking capabilities directly to our platform of the dynamic region. So in BNX, we split this into layers. The first layer is the CMAC, which is the integrated Ethernet subsystem that is hardened on the UltraScale Plus devices. And this kernel is, uh, has a specific configuration depending on the video card and in the interface is actually targeted. And the, this kernel is connected to those GOE transceivers pin as well as the reference clock. And as a, uh, the connection with the CMAC kernel with the user logic or with the next model is done using a 512 wide access stream interface. The next piece, and this is the network layer itself. In this case for VNX, is, it uses UDP as a transport protocol. And in this case again, so for VNX, it has a single channel application interface to communicate with the compute kernel. So, VNX is building layers, and it is that is done to, to easily adapt this design for the given application. For instance, you could actually remove the network layer and connect the user kernel directly to the CMAC to gain some or to reduce the latency or to do experiments. Finally, VNX supports multiple interfaces and cards, and this is due to the way that it actually was built in this kind of layers or different kernels that can be swapped among different platforms. Currently, VNX supports U50, U250, and U280. Let's dive deep a little bit on the, the network layer itself. So this is based on Limago, which was part of my PhD thesis a few years back. And on the, let me ask about this. On the front-hand side here, you have the communication with the, with the CMAC kernel, which is a 512 axis stream interface, uh, a plain one. And this is composed of three models three main models, the ARP table, which provides a translation between MAC and IP addresses, and it has a 256 table that is accessible from the host side. The ICMP model provides the ping functionality to check connectivity with other network equipment. And finally, the, the UDP model that allows us, what well, works as a transport protocol, and it has a 16 entry table for the connection that's used as a connection table. Again, this table is actually accessible from the host side where you can actually configure it and read it. And finally, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the connect the, con the interface between the network layer for VNX and the compute kernel is done by a 512 bit access stream interface in a single channel. And the way you actually specify which of these connections you actually want to target is with the D destination uh, sideband uh, signal on the Axis stream interface. As part of VNX, there are two examples. And the first one is a basic example that provides two user kernels. And one is from pushing data from the host side to the network side. And the other one is to push pull data from the network to the, uh, to the host side. It's worth mentioning that the networking interfaces on the video cards are not visible as a regular uh, networking interfaces on the host. Instead, you actually have to allocate some buffers using R XRT under the hood and move the data around the, the around from the host to the FPA and from the FPA to the host, depending on the direction you actually want to. This is the base, so you can actually move some data, just the base example, the basic that you can actually run. And the second example is a benchmark example. And this is a little bit more complicated. Now, this example allows us to run experiments to benchmark a throughput and latency for this for VNX. And the, the benchmark kernel itself is split in two or com is composed of two models: a traffic generator that uh, allows us to run or to generate traffic in four different modes to to target one of these or to measure throughput or, or latency. And finally, finally, the collector which actually gathers statistics for a given uh, experiment and provides us to the end user. And 
as I mentioned on the beginning of the presentation, this session is all about uh, scaling out. We won't be talking about the scaling out if we don't talk about distributed configuration. If you think about what actually is happening when you are running your accelerator on FPGA, there are many steps uh, involved on this. These are actually run, uh, done automatically by the tools under the hood, but regardless, those happen. So if in this case, there are, I described five steps. So the first one is to configure the device, it's just to download the, the F accelerator to the user logic. And in the case of the VNX, you actually have to configure the AP address for a given accelerator, a given view card run the IRP discovery to, to check or to map the IP addresses of the other nodes as well, and populate or create the UDP table as well. After that, you can allocate some buffers on the host side, move, move those buffers from the host to the FBA, run those accelerator, the, the acceleration, and finally read the results back from the FBA. Those steps are quite easy to do when you are actually running or you have the, the accelerator in the same host as you're actually running this, this code on the, on the compute. But when you're actually trying to scale out, potentially the, the accelerators are not going to be in the same physical cost. And they actually pose a problem because now, or if there was, there is no easy way to actually do that. You could potentially use MPI or things like that, but there is no clear path to do that. For that reason, we introduced Dask on Pink, and Dask is a flexible library for parallel computing in Python, and we'll actually leverage Dask to, to run our pin code on top of that and do the distributed, the distributed computation. So we can actually write a Python code using the pink API on JupyterLab notebooks. And as part of VNX, we provide this Dask class wrapper that allows you to do distributed configuration, remote buffer allocation, remote stack execution, basically all the same functionality as pink, but distributed. And that's worth mentioning that this is not a specific of BNX. You can actually do this uh, for the other applications. And if you're familiar with the uh, pink API, so the only difference in here is when you're actually creating an overlay object with your XLBM file, you actually specify a device, and this device is associated to one of the task workers. And that below that, or the next, uh, the steps that are actually run are exactly the same as what you, you will do with a pink, uh, pink accelerator. And before moving on to Chen Hao, so these are the, the, some of the results from the benchmark application I mentioned earlier. So this table has two, uh, two columns. One is the for, for throughput at application level and the other is transcript time at application level as well both for point-to-point -point and using the switch that I described one of the uh, earlier slides. So you can see that the, the throughput in, actually increases with the packet size, which is on the x-axis and the y-axis is the throughput in the eight per second. And BNX actually achieves a theoretical throughput with a packet size of 256 bytes. And in terms of round trip time, point-to-point uh, -point is around 1.05 microseconds. And with the switch in the middle is 2.75 microseconds, which is quite good. And you can actually check those results that are included on the notebooks as part of the release of VNX. With that, I would like to hand over to Shen Hao for his, his internet presentation. So first, uh, let me give you a little bit more background on why do we need network on the FPGAs. So in the past, people have net, uh, network FPGA together with uh, point to point serial link or proprietary protocols. This might fit embedding settings or smaller clusters, uh, but uh, it has been changed uh, in recent years as the FPGAs have been massively deployed in the data center uh, as what Catapult project has done. So, with such a heterogeneous computing resources, we need to think about how to make uh, the computing more efficient. And one direction that we need to think is that all the devices within these heterogeneous clusters need to be able to talk to each other. And this means that the FPGAs should also be equipped with network stacks that is equivalent to those used in data centers 
for example, UDP and TCP. And UDP is what Mario has shown you before, which is a lightweight protocol uh, with lower latency, uh, but also doesn't guarantee reliable transmission. And here I'm presenting you the TCP, which is a little bit more complicated and incurs a lot more overhead in terms of latency, but this guarantees to you um, reliable transmission. So with this setting, it enables uh, many in-network processing and distributed applications. However, in order to design such uh, distributed applications, uh, there are still quite a lot of challenges. First is that uh, um, the commonly available framework, such as the Whitey's, Rivado, uh, they don't support networks uh, directly. And second, uh, in the software world, when we design a distributed application, we heavily rely on higher level abstractions such as MPI. However, uh, in the hardware world, uh, the abstraction targeting FPGA clusters uh, is far from uh, enough. So with this in mind, uh, the EasyNet aims to bridge the gap. First, we integrate a 100 gigabit TCP IP stack into the Whitey's platform. We wanna take advantage of high level synthesis such that uh, the programmer can uh, program the network application easier. And also we wanna abstract the network data movement Second, uh, the EasyNet aims to provide a higher level of uh, uh, abstraction for communication. We want to provide some point-to-point -point communication, collective communication, and more importantly, these uh, primitive communication primitives should be easy to instantiate. So this is the overall architecture of uh, EasyNet. So it is pretty much similar to what Mario has shown uh, before. Uh, the major difference is that in, in the middle, the network kernel is replaced by a 100 gigabit TCP IP stack instead of uh, the UDP one. So it can support thousands of connections saturating uh, line rates. And another difference is that um, the uh, network kernel has two extra interfaces to the uh, memory. And this is required because TCP IP needs uh, some uh, memory space for temporary buffering and uh, data retransmission. So from the perspective of the application developer, he actually only need to consider the user kernel and the interface between the user kernel and the network kernel. The instantiation of the network kernel and the CMAC kernel uh, is actually hidden away from the uh, application developer. So this is the interface between the user kernel and network kernel. And maybe at the first glance, you already feel that uh, we need a higher level abstraction uh, for the network application. So you can see that there are a dozen of uh, interfaces. They are divided into uh, different uh, groups. For example, there is listen port uh, interface, open connection interface, and interfaces for transmission and uh, receiving. And all these interfaces, they follow a uh, handshake protocol. And even though uh, by integrating the TCP IP into Whitey's, you can already program this handshake in high level synthesis using C, but this is still a um, tedious process and is very, very error poor. And this leads to uh, the next step of, uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this work. So the second part of the work, uh, we aim to provide some MPI-like primitives uh, for this 100 gigabit TCP IP stack with Whitey's. And these primitives are essential for distributed applications because most of the applications, they require either send receive or, or, or other collective primitives such as broadcast, scatter, gather, reduce, and or reduce. So here I'm showing you um, the interfaces or let's say the function call to the send and uh, receive primitives. So for send and re receive, uh, it incurs only one TCP IP connection between two nodes. 
the uh, the function is written in high level synthesis C, and it aims to hide the control handshake of the TCP IP stack. Let's look at the, the same function. Uh, you need to provide a memory pointer of the send data, how many bytes you want to send, the session, which is used to distinguish different connections, and a structure which uh, examples the interfaces to the uh, TCP IP kernel. And more importantly, you should be aware that uh, for these send and receive primitives, uh, the data type uh, supported includes both streaming or memory pointer, and it can be used in a data flow region such that um, the data transmission and the computation can be overlapped, overlapped and this uh, reduces the overall runtime. Next, I will uh, talk a little bit about the collective primitives. And for these primitives, uh, it requires the interaction of several nodes, and usually it will occur, it, it will re require several connections. There are several algorithms to implement uh, these uh, collective primitives. Uh, in our case, we choose uh, the all to one architecture and the one to all architecture. So for broadcast, on the master node, uh, we run this broadcast function. And on the slave node, it will receive uh, the data uh, coming from the uh, master node. And similarly, we have the um, all to one architecture also for reduce. And with this uh, broadcast and reduce, we can now build uh, other primitives uh, above that. So this is an example of uh, all reduced primitive. It is uh, built upon uh, this reduce and broadcast. So on the master node, uh, we have a function call that incurs the reduce and then followed by a broadcast. And then on the slave node, uh, each, uh, each node uh, just need to have a function call that consists of uh, ascend and receive. So with these uh, simple collectives, we can already start to build uh, the distributed applications. But more importantly, we need to make sure that these primitives are of high performance. So this is the performance examination of our primitives. First, we examine the latency and the throughput uh, for send and the receive primitives. On the left-hand side, you can also see the open connection time uh, between two FPGAs and uh, one FPGA and, FP and the CPU. We can see that uh, the opening connection time between FPGAs is always more than an order of magnitude uh, faster than uh, open connection uh, to an CPU. On the right-hand side, you can see the throughput measurements over various data size with send and receive primitives. We can see that the inter-FPGA communication can easily saturate 100 gigabit per second and with a relatively small amount of data. However, uh, with CPU, it is difficult to saturate 100 gigabits and also it requires a larger amount of data in order to achieve its peak. So on the CPU side, in order to saturate the 100 gigabits, then you need to have multiple connections instead of one. And also you need to have a larger packet size such that you can amortize the packet header processing overhead on the CPU side. Then let us examine the uh, performance of the collective primitives. So here uh, we show the performance of broadcast and all reduce, and all the experiments are running on uh, four nodes, either four FPGAs or running on four CPUs. Uh, all of them are interconnected by 100 gigabit network switch. So we can see that for both the broadcast and all reduce, the FPGAs can uh, achieve a lower latency than the CPU counterpart. 
So with this, we conclude that um, uh, the easy net uh, can efficiently abstract the uh, network communication primitives and provides a high performance. So I will conclude with these slides and I will hand over to Mario. Hey, thank you, Shanghao. This, this table is actually showing some of the features uh, of the two solutions, ECNet and BNX. And I would really like to focus on the bottom part of this table. So the demo platform, both of them support pretty much the same. The host code, one provides OpenCL host code and the other pink, but there is no reason why you can couldn't use one of the other in this in the other platforms. So the, the, the major difference is starting here. So ECNet provides TCP, which is a real level transport protocol. And because of that, you can actually do packet reordering. And if there is any packet loss, the protocol itself is going to make sure that you actually get the, all the packets. Whereas on the VNX, so the UDP uh, by definition is unreadable. Therefore, there is no easy way uh, with the protocol itself just to do packet reordering. That could be possible if you build something on top of the UDP and application that actually, or another layer that actually takes care of that. And ECNet supports a single interface, 100G interface, whereas VNX supports up to two, depending on the card itself. As Shenhao mentioned, ECNet needs uh, either one or two uh, external memory banks in order to, to be able to store the payload, whereas VNX doesn't require, require, require sorry, any, any memory bank. The number of connections, so by default, ECNet supports 1,000 connections but can be higher or lower depending on your application and the number of resources is going to change depending on that number of connections. VNX only supports 16 connections. And this, I would say that's it's not a hard limitation, but it's going to be difficult to go higher than that because the way that, that actually the lookup is done. And the application interface between the network layer and the application. So ECNet is a little bit more complicated. It uses five channels to do the full communication whereas VNX is much simpler and uses a single channel with the metadata embedded in that channel. Throughput, both of them reach max theoretical throughput with a single connection, and where, well, while ECNet requires a 1500 bytes uh, packet size, VNX does it with a 256. After that, everything is theoretical maximum. RTT, VNX is ha almost half of, is faster than that in, in that regard. And finally, in terms of resource consumption, only for the network layer is around, ECNet requires almost 4x more uh, in average resources to implement the TCP. So the takeaway of this table is that uh, because of the nature of TCP and the reliability, you actually need more resources and you pay latency for that. And in terms of the absolute numbers, so VNX, that the, the 4x is, is a big number, but if you if you look at the full picture with the, all the resources for a given board for the U280, you still have plenty of resources to implement ECNet or VNX on your application on your accelerator car and implement your application on top of that. So the only takeaway of this is that really depending on your application and on your needs, you might choose one or another. So for a given application, I should say for a local area uh, configuration, UDP might be enough. But if you actually want to do some fancy stuff, TCP might be the, the way to go. And finally, I would like to conclude. So uh, we have presented two solutions for TCP and EDP that provides networking and RBO cards on top of VITES. Both of them are open source. Contributions are very welcome. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, the selection on which of these uh, frameworks or libraries to use depends on the, uh, your application and requirements. And finally, so the ECNet is when the ECNet paper is going to appear in, the, in this FPL 21. Shanghai, there are a couple of questions. We won't get through all of them, but perhaps we could take one of them. I see a question from Johannes, a speaker from the first XACC Tech Talk, and he's asking, how can distributed applications overlap computation and communication using your communication primitives? Okay, thanks Johannes for the question. Um, so when I mentioned in the slides that um, um, the, the communication and the computation can be overlapped, I, I mainly refer to the fact that when the, the, the easy net or the functions 
they support um, the, the data flow region, which means that uh, it doesn't necessarily need uh, to finish the previous uh, computation uh, before you can start the sending process or, or, or collective process uh, of the communication. And this basically means that uh, on, on, on the local node, uh, when you start to compute and uh, giving already some first partial result, then you can already uh, send it out. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. The, there are a couple of other questions, but uh, perhaps you can answer those, uh, type answers to those, and we'll move on to the next section. In this next section, Dr. Lucien Petrika from Xilinx Research Labs will talk about his work on Elastic DF, which is part of the FIN framework and leverages the networking capabilities discussed in the previous talk. Elastic DF allows the performance of deep neural network inference to be scaled out across multi-die and network connected FPGAs. Thanks, Kahal. Hi, everyone. Um, like Kahal mentioned, this is a talk uh, about uh, a tool that we built to enable us to scale our fin accelerators to large FPGAs and multiple FPGAs in the data center. This is a brief overview of uh, work which has been uh, published in uh, Threats and will appear shortly. So I'll uh, start the talk off by just setting the stage and um, discussing exactly what type of uh, accelerator I will be touching upon. Uh, so most of you uh, will probably be familiar with the Vitis AI type of um, accelerator for DNN inference. And that is visible on the left here. And uh, in uh, my terminology, we call this a matrix of uh, processing elements. So this is an accelerator which typically consists of a, um, a systolic array of uh, DSP engines. Um, it's a one-size-fits-all solution, so um, it's uh, one accelerator that can execute multiple types of layers, and it executes them in a sequence uh, one by one, uh, one after the other. In this type of accelerator, the off-chip memory is required to store the intermediate, weight, intermediate activations and store the weights and the original images and classifications. And uh, the connectivity between the um, matrix of uh, processing elements, or rather between the processing elements themselves, uh, needs to be very low latency to achieve high frequency. Um, fortunately, because this is a one-size-fits-all type of accelerator, um, this is easy to hand optimize. And uh, you can go down to the RTL, you can do floor planning of your, of your design, and so on. So typically, this type of uh, accelerator uh, uh, approach, uh, the matrix of processing elements, is one which you will find running in relatively high uh, frequencies in FPGA. So Vitis AI touches on 300 megahertz, and I have seen 500 to, to 700 in, in uh, other work and research. Now, what, what I will be talking about is the approach that Finn takes, uh, which is our research uh, DNN inference compiler, which is the one illustrated on the uh, right here. So uh, this uh, approach is based on uh, pipeline data flow. That is an approach where each layer in the original DNN is represented by a hardware block in the FPGA, which is dedicated to implementing that specific layer and nothing else. So that means that you will have a pipeline of these layers that mirror the structure of the uh, DNN and the data will flow through the pipeline. And most of the times the parameters are uh, hosted on chip next to the compute uh, engines, either LUTs or DSPs that uh, execute the actual computation. So off chip memory is not usually required, but it may be required sometimes uh, if your images come from uh, main memory, then obviously you will need uh, external memory to, to intermediate between the host and the device. Uh, but in some scenarios, uh, the data can stream through from, from other sources and can stream out without requiring main memory at all. Um, the advantage uh, uh, from uh, pipeline data flow structurally is that uh, the connectivity between the pipeline blocks, which are these ones here, are uh, latency tolerant. Uh, typically, these are axis streams, so you can uh, spend a couple of cycles uh, traveling a large distance on the FPGA without necessarily uh, losing uh, clock frequency. 
And as will become important later on, you can, for example, perform on SLR crossing, so cross between two dies on a multi-die FPGA on the interface between two blocks. Now, uh, the uh, problem with uh, the pipeline data flow approach is that these accelerators are necessarily auto-generated. Um, they're auto-generated because they derive from the structure of the DNN which they will implement. So, for example, if you want to switch to a different DNN, then necessarily the structure will be different. So you have to generate for each DNN um, a particular accelerator. And if you're working in research or if you're doing frequent iterations of your DNN in a, a co-design type of approach, uh, then you need something to generate your network, um, your accelerator or the network. And typically that involves uh, HLS compilation, which gives you the flexibility to do that, but it's difficult to hand optimize these accelerators. So typically in pipeline data flow, uh, you will see lower maximum frequencies uh, compared to the matrix of processing elements. And therefore the benefits of this type of uh, approach to inference are somewhat lost uh, to, to end users. So in this context, uh, I, will discuss, I will be discussing in this presentation a tool that we built to try to get more performance out of uh, the uh, pipeline data flow concept and to enable us to scale out a pipeline data flow uh, from a single FPGA out to multiple FPGAs in a data center. So the agenda uh, now is uh, I will discuss the challenges of data flow accelerator design on uh, multi-SLR and multi-FPGA platforms. So just to clarify, the SLR in Xilinx terminology is an independent FPGA die within the context of a multi-die uh, FPGA. And I will discuss uh, real-world experience with FIN data flow accelerators. And then I will introduce Elastic DF, a partitioning tool which we uh, implemented to enable us to perform uh, better um, SLR crossing and to enable us to scale out. And then I will show uh, its application to single and multi alveo pen designs. First of all, um, I'll start with some uh, terminology on the fin side so that you understand uh, the certain things on, on the following slides. Uh, so fin is uh, an accelerator compiler. It takes uh, a neural network uh, description uh, which is uh, typically delivered from uh, Brevitas, which is a tool that we specifically built to enable quantized neural networks. Then uh, Finn performs a set of uh, uh, streamlining transformations, is what we call them. So a set of transformations which reduce the original DNN graph to something which is, um, which is able to be transformed into FPGA circuitry. Following the streamlining, there is an HLS conversion. So all of the blocks that remain after streamlining are uh, generated in C++ code. Uh, then there is a folding step, which I will touch upon uh, immediately. And then all of this goes into the back end, which is synthesis using the tools that all of you know and love, uh, which is Vivaro and Vitus, uh, and that results in a XL bin or a bit file, which we program into the FPGA. Now, on the folding side, um, I have to mention that uh, there are a number of parallelism um, directions uh, which enable the users of FIN to specify different amounts of performance and different, different amounts of resource utilization uh, from the individual layers uh, in a FIN data flow graph. So, at the uppermost uh, layer, we have uh, the, uh, the layer level parallelism, which is uh, the fact that we have a pipeline here, like I discussed uh, in the previous slides. Uh, then within each of these layers, there is uh, this parallelism level of working on multiple uh, pixels simultaneously, potentially. Then there is a channel parallelism um, layer, which is uh, we can work on multiple channels simultaneously. And then uh, each of these uh, PEs, as we call them, uh, are SIMD machines which perform uh, SIMD multiply and accumulate. So this uh, framework will generate a design for you and uh, you will specify the folding, such as the utilization in resources and the performance that you desire. And ideally you would want to go into this backend. The backend delivers um, 
some result to you, which is uh, high performance, high frequency, and then you just use it. Now, the um, actual um, uh, the actual reality is that uh, it's not as simple as just synthesizing uh, the design and having high performance uh, from the get-go. And this is because the FPGAs that we are targeting uh, in the data center context, so large FPGAs, are uh, non-homogeneous. So they consist of multiple dyes um, illustrated here. So each of these is an FPGA die. They sit on the same interposer. And uh, they are connected through uh, what is called super long lines. So these are wires through the interposer, and they connect two dies to each other. And uh, we may have a connectivity to, to the external world, world. So let's say we have uh, some other FPGA on the other side of uh, uh, this interface, which may carry Ethernet packets, like the guys have uh, described before. And uh, this FPGA is um, managed by uh, Xilinx developed uh, so-called shell, which is a static region, which consists of uh, PCIe interfaces and uh, DMAs to carry data from the host to the device. Now, inside of this, uh, uh, of this area, which is called the dynamic region, we implement our accelerator. And the, if the accelerator needs any resources, such as reset uh, signals, axi interfaces, access to, uh, to memory, then uh, other infrastructure will be implemented in these uh, areas. So in this context, if we do compile an accelerator with FIN, and let's say we, we set the parallelism parameters of the uh, accelerator such that we think we, we utilize the most out of our FPGA, right? So we want to utilize uh, as much resources as uh, possible. And what uh, comes out of the back end of FIN is something like this. So there is an accelerator kernel. It's connected to a reset controller and AXI interface and memory in, um, let's say, SLR1 uh, here. And the accelerator will reach out across the other um, SLRs, and uh, it'll do its uh, job. Data will be transported, and so on. Now. There is a problem with this, uh, with this approach. So if you just let Vivado do the compilation here, then what you will end up with is uncontrolled SLR crossings. So um, you don't really know exactly which block in your design is being uh, split between SLR1 and SLR2. Uh, same with SLR2 and SLR3. So, it may be that Vivado makes the right decision and cuts across the face where you would cut if you were looking at this design yourself as, a, as an expert FPGA designer. Uh, but at the same time, Vivado may just arbitrarily cut somewhere where it'll uh, destroy your uh, maximum frequency. So this is a, a problem in, uh, in actual designs. A less known problem is that uh, you can have the same uh, SLR crossing problem for reset lines. So for example, if my accelerator is uh, specified as uh, a single block, then uh, Vitus will uh, have a single reset line to connect to it. Uh, that will typically come from the reset controller in the same uh, SLR where the BDR controller is. Uh, and if your accelerator spans out to other SLRs, then your reset has to go across uh, the SLR crossing and possibly across two SLR crossings and get to the uh, destinations uh, in the SLR3. So all of this is a recipe for low uh, frequency, at least compared to matrices of uh, processing elements. So um, what can we do? Well, we can uh, take the approach of uh, manually splitting up uh, these uh, accelerators. Uh, it's, it's more uh, labor intensive. Uh, but you can do it. So you can do a so-called monotonic partitioning, uh, where you uh, take the first uh, few uh, DNN layers and put them in one accelerator. You take the next DNN layers and put them in the, in the next accelerator. Uh, and then you, you have the final accelerator. So now your uh, DNN, instead of being one kernel and being relatively easy to, to manage, it's three kernels. Uh, you have to, to do extra configuration, uh, and there's other headaches to be taken into account. So, for example, if you do uh, perform this partitioning in this way, uh, you need to have uh, another DDR controller here with the DDR memory attached, or maybe it's HBM, 
And uh, this increases your logic utilization and also typically increases the required power. Also, uh, this approach assumes that we can perform the cuts arbitrarily. So um, it assumes that we can, there are three um, equally sized pieces of the accelerator that we can cut the uh, accelerator into and we can fit them on, uh, on the SLRs in this way. And this is not, uh, not generally the case. Um, just to motivate this, um, I will just show you the resource utilization profile for a ResNet 50 accelerator uh, built with FEN, uh, and just highlight uh, the memory uh, utilization um, of the accelerator. So these are different layers. They're clustered together. Uh, there, are, there are more layers than this, but I put them into clusters. And what we can see here is the uh, VRAM requirements, the, the on-chip memory requirements are asymmetric. So you start off with very little, then it keeps going up, and the final uh, three clusters have very high uh, utilization. So what this means is that if I want to balance block RAM or on-chip memory generally, uh, then I am going to space these out as much as possible. Ideally, I would want to have uh, this one in SLR zero, this one in SLR uh, one, and this one in SLR two, or something like this. Uh, but uh, obviously, if uh, my uh, partitioning is monotonic, then everything that goes before this one has to go into the same SLR. So this creates uh, a bottleneck around lots, and, and uh, therefore, there is no clear solution to do a monotonic uh, partitioning of this design. Now, what I did end up doing first time I, I built this design is uh, I built a non-monotonic partitioning uh, by hand. So non-monotonic means that uh, my uh, partitioning uh, results in a snaking um, floor plan like this one. So I have, uh, uh, have my, my partitions uh, illustrated in this way. Uh, then uh, I have other partitions which go back on the SLRs which I previously visited. And then I go forward again and back. So um, all of this avoids the, uh, the bottlenecking on on-chip memory or LUTs and also ensures that I have only a single uh, interface to memory. Uh, but uh, obviously, this isn't trivial to build uh, by hand. So um, you wouldn't want to do this uh, all the time. Um, one question would be, why don't we change the, uh, the folding? Why don't we change the parallelism characteristics of these layers to make them uh, use as resources? Well, you can't really do that. Uh, in a thin uh, layer, sorry, in a thin uh, data flow graph, all of the layers have to have the same uh, throughput. So therefore, uh, the folding of one uh, layer uh, influences the required folding of the other layers. So, I can start off fully unfolded. Let's say this is the design which fills up the FPGA. And uh, then um, I can uh, go down uh, in, in this way. So uh, this means that um, um, there, there's a dependency between layers. But also, if we actually look at what happens in reality, my memory doesn't really scale that much. And it makes sense because we don't have, uh, um, we, we have to hold the parameters somewhere, right? So memory doesn't scale. So the Elastic DF Partitioner uh, fixes this problem by taking a graph and multiple uh, layer resource estimates uh, generated by Finn in our case, but generally you can generate it with another tool. And it performs non-monotonic partitioning with several uh, added features. So you can partition to a generalized multi-SLR uh, device where the SLR connects either via uh, super long lines or via Ethernet. It ensures resource utilization remains below some user specified limits in each SLR and the connectivity requirements re remain below specified uh, limits and performs sim simultaneous resource allocation uh, with uh, partitioning by choosing one implementation um, from the available implementations for each node. Uh, and we also have relative, that is layer to layer and absolute layer to SLR anchors. And this has been implemented with uh, uh, integer linear programming in Python code. Uh, it runs on the Python MIP solver and is uh, relatively fast to solve, at least uh, compared to the typical synthesis run of an FPGA design. So we, what we did uh, for the, uh, the research work that I mentioned is that we integrated this partitioner in FEN and we applied it to ResNet 50 and mobile. So 
we applied it in the in the following scenario. So first of all, partitioning to uh, control uh, congestion and control the SLR crossing. Uh, then um, adding in partition resource allocation to select from different implementations to perform so-called compression. So reducing the total size, the total number of SLRs required to implement an accelerator. And then we can replicate the accelerator and get uh, additional throughput uh, by leveraging this, uh, this compression. So um, I'll start off with the, um, with the frequency related uh, benefits. So we estimated, uh, we evaluated this on uh, XACC um, with the U280 and U250. And um, I can just highlight the uh, speed ups uh, compared to, uh, to the vanilla designs. So 74, 76, 90%, 58%, these are increases in frequency uh, by applying the partitioning and better controlling the SLR crossing and also better controlling the, uh, the reset allocation uh, from reset controllers to actual kernels. So uh, what we find is that reset, op reset optimization accounts for most of the FMAX improvement on less congested designs and partitioning is beneficial for high congested designs. And as a guideline, I, we, we suggest that you use multi-kernel virus designs instead of monolithic because of the first uh, finding there. This is an example of uh, how the partitioning looks. And I think you will agree with me that this isn't something that you would find manually. Uh, and you do really need uh, non-monotonic partitioning and resource allocation in the partitioner to be able to fit two mobile nets uh, in the uh, U280 in this case. Now, in multi-FPGA uh, scenarios, uh, what you want to do is, uh, instead of going from one SLR to the other, you want to control how you go from one FPGA to the other. And you can do this by partitioning your design uh, in, two, in, in three ways. Uh, you can partition and uh, move data across the hosts, which is not uh, very interesting to us. But you can also partition uh, in this way, uh, sort of monotonically at the uh, FPGA level. Uh, and uh, transmit data over uh, UDP in our case, or TCP if you want to. And we call this uh, hardware uh, model parallel. And uh, using anchors, which is a feature that I uh, didn't uh, touch a lot upon, uh, you can, of our partitioner, you can uh, implement transparent model parallelism. So this is a case where the partitioning uh, is non-monotonic. It travels out to, through the first FPGA, out to the second or more FPGAs, then returns back to the first FPGA and to the host. So in this case, it's transparent because you don't really see the parallelism. You see the accelerator as one single accelerator, but it somehow spills out to other FPGAs uh, over UDP. And again, this is a hybrid approach uh, where you can uh, have uh, one instance of a three instance design. One instance spills over to the other FPGA through transparent model parallelism and two instances are single uh, FPGA designs. And you can control this through a combination of uh, data parallelism and model parallelism, where the actual model parallelism is uh, transparent. Um, these, are, these are results uh, from our evaluation. So uh, what we're looking at is um, uh, benefits in being able to fit more designs. So in, um, in uh, uh, this case, we are able to fit three designs on two FPGAs, which we wouldn't be able to without uh, partitioning. And also we are able to split um, ResNet 50 designs uh, across multiple uh, FPGAs, which wouldn't normally fit a ResNet 50 design. And uh, we measure uh, latency and, uh, and throughput. Uh, and we estimate uh, power for the CPU and we measure power for the FPGA. Now, um, what I want to highlight out of this is that uh, both the transparent model parallel and, and harder model parallel are way less latency uh, than the softer model parallel. So going directly FPGA to FPGA is obviously a beneficial um, approach rather than going through the host. And you can also see not necessarily that just the latency uh, is uh, smaller, uh, but also the latency has, a, has a, um, a fatter tail in the software implementation. So this is minimum latency, maximum latency, 50th percentile and 99th percentile. 
So you have a better clustering of latencies around the, around the average here. So overall, uh, we, we see that uh, in the uh, hardware model parallel and uh, transparent model parallel, uh, the latency of our inference is identical to the latency of a single FPGA accelerator, even though we're going out over the network and coming back. The added latency is a couple of microseconds. It's the round trip latency of uh, VNX, uh, which uh, Mario uh, talked about before. So, um, as, uh, as future research directions, um, we believe this, uh, this partitioner um, can be integrated with, with FIN uh, to provide an official multi-FPGA inference capability. Uh, obviously, there are uh, different things to do to better integrate it with a co-design process uh, generally. Uh, but we also believe that uh, we can extend the applicability of this partitioner to general purpose uh, data flow compute graphs. Uh, the, the partitioner itself is not fin specific. It is a piece of Python code. Uh, it runs on a generic description of a graph and uh, the resources of the vertices and of the edges. So it can in theory be applied to anything, um, which is data flow and maps to FPGA. So feel free to, to talk to me about this if you are interested. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lucien. Question from Johannes. How do you get the resource estimates that you feed to the partitioning algorithm? Is this done automatically using estimates, for example, from HLS or Vovado? Uh, yes, thanks, Johannes, for the, for the question. Uh, this is actually a, an interesting topic of, of current research uh, in our lab. So what we did for this work is that we used synthesis uh, results from Vivado. So we ran the accelerator through the synthesis flow we got uh, hierarchical utilization, and then we fed that back into the partitioner, and we re-implemented the design. Uh, what we can do in FIN is we can utilize a model of the resource utilization, and we can do the partitioning based on that model. If you actually look at FIN examples, we have uh, partitioning flows for single FPGA designs there, which utilize FIN as, uh, for, for resource estimates, and that's, that's decent quality. We haven't used HLS because it's pretty bad. Um, at least for, for LUTs with memories, it's a little bit better. But this is definitely an area where if we could build better models, then it would benefit the partitioning. OK, thanks, Lucien. And a big thank you to our three speakers, to Mario, to Zenha, and to Lucien. Thank you very much. And with that, I'll close this session.